Okay, this is part two of the lecture on power. We're just going to take a look at two basic dynamical examples involving power. With these examples, we're going to keep it as simple as possible. I'm essentially going to give you an understanding as to why we bother to define the quantity of power, specifically from an engineering standpoint. So let's take a look at the first, two, first of two examples. Let me read it to you here, copy it down into your notes. Okay, a machine pulls a one kilogram object horizontally across the surface. The machine is going to be me, and then right here is my one kilogram object. Okay, there's a little bit of kinetic friction between the object and the surface below. We're given a coefficient here of 0.1, and then I pull or push on the object like so with a force of 10 newtons. 10 newtons is just a couple of pounds of force. But I don't apply that force for a split second, as you saw me do here at my desk. Instead, I do this for a full five minutes. The object is initially at rest. Part A and B of the problem is a basic dynamical situation where we're going to set up F equals MA first and then find the acceleration and then use that acceleration to do a little bit of kinematics. We'll find the object's final speed and the distance traveled. So let's take a look at that first for parts A and B. Let's begin by drawing out a basic problem. Okay, so here's my surface. Here's my object. It's initially at rest. The object has a mass of a kilogram. There's some kinetic friction. The coefficient is 0.1. I come along then and exert a force horizontally like so. We're going to call it F push just to give it a name. And that's equal to 10 newtons, which is once again just a couple of pounds of force. Okay, and then the object ends up over here like so with a speed V. We undergo here a displacement, delta R, and we push on the object for a full five minutes. Five minutes is five times 60 or 300 seconds. Okay, so to do the kinematics, we're going to have to figure out what the acceleration of the object is. Of course, we'll do so by doing a little bit of F equals MA. So as I push the object horizontally to the right-hand side and there's kinetic friction, we have the following force diagram. We have, first of all, vertically, the normal force and the weight, just canceling each other out. And then horizontally to the right-hand side, we have the F push here. It's in the same direction as the displacement vector delta R. You're right here opposing the motion is the force of kinetic friction and then the acceleration A is going to be to the right hand side. So add up the forces here horizontally first. We're going to have F push, then minus the force of kinetic friction equals MA. Force of kinetic friction is the coefficient multiplied by the normal force. The normal force is equal to the weight, and then divide by the mass M now to get the acceleration. Okay, so a basic dynamical situation involving a horizontal situation with kinetic friction, much as we've seen before. Okay, so let's plug in these numbers here. Let's see, 10 minus 0.1 times 1 times 9.8, and then all divided by 1 kilogram. And this ends up being 9.02 meters per second squared, which is a little bit less than a G. So then therefore, I basically take the object and I do it like this, given an acceleration in that direction of 9.02 meters per second squared, which is once again a little bit less than a G, much like what you just saw when I initially pushed the object to the right-hand side. But I don't do this for a moment, instead we do this for a full five minutes. So now let's go ahead in part A of the problem, do a little bit of one-dimensional kinematics, and find the final speed. Okay, so we've got V equals V naught plus AT, where the object starts at rest, so V is just equal to AT. So 9.02 meters per second squared multiplied by 300 seconds, and this ends up being 2,706 meters per second. That's a little bit less than three kilometers per second. So if I take this object and I do this like so, accelerate it in that direction at a little bit less than a G, but I do this for a full five minutes, it ends up with a speed of nearly three kilometers per second. Why can't I do this? That has to do with power, which we'll get to in parts C and D of the problem in just a few minutes. Now let's go ahead and calculate the displacement, the distance over which the object moves. Once again, we'll drop back to one-dimensional kinematics to do so. So here's my position equation for constant acceleration. The object starts at rest, so the first term is equal to zero. And this is just one-half at squared. So let's go ahead and calculate that. So one-half times 9.02, and then multiply by 300 squared. And this ends up being 405,900 meters. That's about 406 kilometers. That's a couple of hundred miles. So if I take this object and I go like so out towards the east, say in this direction, and I do this for a full five minutes, I end up in the Mojave Desert somewhere, and the speed of the object will be nearly three kilometers per second. Okay, why can't I easily do this? Once again, it has to do with power. 
let's go ahead and get to the next portions of the problem. I need to move my file to do so. Okay, so first of all, in part C of the problem, we're going to do the average calculations over this broad time interval of 300 seconds. We're going to calculate the average power delivered, as we sometimes say, due to the machine, and also the average power loss due to friction. These two calculations will illustrate the two problems that we face when doing mechanical work in an engineering situation. Okay, let me jump to the lower board and do all of this. Okay, so part C, we're going to calculate the average power output, or the average power delivered by the machine. This is going to be equal to the work done by F push, because that's the force that the machine applies, and then we'll divide by the time interval. So the numerator of the expression is just our dot product. So this is the dot product between F push, and the displacement, and then what we'll do is we'll just divide by time. So the angle between these two vectors up on the top board is zero degrees. Cosine of zero degrees is positive one. So the numerator is basically just force times distance, like so. But then we divide by time, and then we end up with an answer in terms of watts, joules per second. So the numerator of the expression is 10, and then multiply by 405, 900 meters, but then divide by 300 seconds. And this ends up being 13,530 watts. So as an average over this broad time interval, what the machine has to do is it has to deliver to the object or convert into the object's kinetic energy. It has to deliver to the object 13,530 joules of energy per second. That's a lot. You're constrained from doing these large amounts of work by essentially the following. Number one has to do with what is called the energy density of your fuel. It's how much bang you have for your buck, if, will, if you will. Energy density is basically how much energy per unit volume you have. So if you're talking about, say, gasoline or something like that, which is a form of chemical potential energy, you only have so many joules of chemical potential energy per kilogram of gasoline to work with. This is called the energy density. And then what you have to do, in as few a steps as possible and as quickly as possible, you have to convert that chemical potential energy into the kinetic energy of the object itself. The more steps that you have involved in doing this, the more energy you lose as heat over time, the harder and harder it becomes to do this. You're also constrained by the construction of the machine itself. So in the case of me, the reason why I can't accelerate this object up to 2706 meters per second is because I simply don't have the energy density necessary to do that within my muscles. It has chemical potential energy. And then I'm constrained by how my body is constructed in terms of actually moving the object to that enormous speed. So from an engineering standpoint, we have the following constraints. Basically the fuel that we're using and also the construction of the machine itself. In addition, however, to this problem, there's another problem, and then there's the two with friction. So now as an average, let's calculate the average power loss due to friction. So this is P loss. So this is gonna be the work done by kinetic friction, and then we divide it by time. So this is gonna be our dot product between the kinetic frictional force vector, and then we divide by time. Okay, of course, we've seen this dot product for horizontal situations before. If you recall from those horizontal situations, we end up with this expression here for the work done by friction over a horizontal displacement. And now let's just go ahead and plug in everything. All right, so negative and then 0.1 for the coefficient times 1 times 9.8 times 405, 900, and we divide by 300 seconds. And this comes out to be about negative 1326 watts. So as an average over this broad time interval, we're losing 1,326 joules of energy per second as heat. You have to get rid of that heat. You have to dump that heat, as we say, and you have to do so as quickly as possible. Because if you don't get rid of it, then, for example, you can melt the object. Presumably, you don't want that to happen. Or you can melt your engine. Presumably, you don't want that to happen either. So as you do work and generate heat in doing so, that's what this calculation is, you have to get rid of that heat as quickly as possible. This is done, for example, in a closed radiator system that you have in an internal combustion engine. Your radiator basically consists of a large metal grill with a large surface area, and metal is a good conductor of heat. 
And then attached to this metal grill is a hose assembly. It's a closed system of radiator fluid that is then circulating within the engine block. So as the engine is operate, operating, it heats up this fluid. The hot fluid then goes to the grill and it then radiates that heat out into the environment. You wanna make sure that you maintain your radiator because if you've ever been in a car where the radiator fails, immediately what happens to the internal temperature gauge in your engine? It skyrockets immediately. And then if you see that happening on your dashboard, stop your car immediately. Because if you don't, your engine's gonna melt. And if your engine melts, then you're gonna have to buy a new car. So make sure that you maintain your radiator because if it fails, then the car will ultimately be destroyed very quickly. And then you wanna make sure, of course, that you always change your oil. The reason why is because if you don't change your oil, this number here gets bigger and bigger. And if this number here gets bigger and bigger, this number gets bigger and bigger, and then therefore the parts wear out that much more easily. So the reason why we bother to define power is that it il nicely illustrates the problems that we face when doing engineering. The problems, however, compound themselves. In other words, as you go faster and faster, the problems get worse and worse. This is illustrated in part D of the example. Let me move my file to illustrate. Okay, so now it says calculate the instantaneous power due to the machine and friction at the end of the problem. That is when the object is moving at 2706 meters per second. Okay, this will illustrate for you here in part D of the problem why very quickly when you operate an automobile it reaches its top speed. Okay, so here's the instantaneous power output due to the machine. This is the dot product between F push and the velocity vector V. Now let me jump back up to the top board here for just a moment. Notice that the velocity vector V is in the same direction as F push. There's a zero degree angle between them. Cosine of zero degrees when doing our dot product is one. So then therefore, we basically end up with here force times speed. So this is 10 newtons multiplied by 2706 meters per second. This ends up being 27,060 watts. So in order for the machine to maintain the object at a speed of 2706 meters per second, it has to deliver to the object 27,060 joules of energy per second. This illustrates why very quickly when you say stamp down on the accelerator of a car, that the car reaches its top speed very quickly. It can only deliver so much energy per second to the object in this case, or when talking about a car, the rotation of the wheels of the car itself. So this problem of basically trying to deliver more and more energy to go faster and faster, well, you run up, again, run up against all of these constraints from an engineering standpoint. The problem also gets worse when it comes to friction as well. So here's the uh, instantaneous power loss, loss due to friction. This is the dot product between the frictional force vector and the velocity vector. These two vectors are at a 180 degree angle on the top board. Cosine of 180 is equal to negative one. So we pick up our negative sign. Here's the coefficient multiplied by the normal force. The normal force is equal to the object's weight. And then we end up with this expression here for the instantaneous power loss as heat due to friction when we're moving at this huge speed. So negative 0.1 times 1 times 9.8 times 2706 meters per second. This ends up being negative 2652 watts. So while the object is moving at that speed, you have to get rid of this amount of energy per second as heat. And if you don't, then there's going to be some sort of catastrophic failure. You're going to melt the object or you're going to melt your engine or something like that. So these power calculations, they illustrate very nicely all of the engineering problems that we face when doing mechanical work. Okay, then for my second example, the second example will be done in English units and it will just give you a basic understanding as to exactly what is meant by one horsepower. Okay, so let me go ahead and get rid of all of this. Okay, let me move my file for the next example. And then go ahead and copy it into your notes as I read it to you here. Okay, so a horse. A horse pulls a cart horizontally while exerting a force of 40 pounds. That's like a light load, if you will, when talking about a beast of burden in an agricultural situation. 
Okay, the horse pulls the cart at a constant speed of nine miles per hour. Nine miles per hour is a good jog for a human being. Okay, the constant speed, by the way, that I have in this problem means that the instantaneous power output of the horse and its average power output will be the same value. So let's just think of it like this. All right, so this right here is going to be the forces exerted upon the cart. So we have the normal force like so, we have the force of gravity, we have the pull from the horse in this direction that's given to us as 40 pounds. And then because we are moving at a constant speed, the acceleration is zero. This then means that there's some force of friction in this direction like so. But basically all that we have to worry about is the 40 pounds of F pull. The force of friction is opposing that and it's also equal to 40 pounds. Our velocity vector V is in this direction and it's given to us as nine miles per hour. Okay, now I do have to convert the miles per hour into feet per second. So let me go ahead and do that. I'm going to first of all multiply by one hour per 3600 seconds, like so. Hours cancels. And then I'll convert miles into feet by doing the following. I'll multiply by 5280 feet per mile, like so. Miles cancels out. And ultimately we'll end up with the speed here in terms of meter, or feet per second. All right, so nine times 5280, and then divide by 3,600 seconds. And in terms of feet per second, this is 13.2 feet per second. Once again, this is a good job for a human being. Okay, now let's calculate the instantaneous power output due to the horse. Okay, so I'm gonna call this P horse, and this is the dot product between the F pole that it exerts and the velocity vector V. Okay, these two vectors, however, are in the same direction for this basic problem. So once again, just think of this as force times speed. Okay, so 13.2 feet per second, and then we multiply it by 40 pounds of force. This ends up being 528 foot-pounds per second. Okay, and now let me go ahead and convert that into horsepower by doing the following. So 528 foot-pounds per second. And then we multiply by the following. One horsepower per 550 foot-pounds per second. That's the conversion factor between the two. Foot-pounds per second cancels out, and then we're left with horsepower. So 528 divided by 550 is just a little bit less than one. This is point. 0.96 horsepower. So once again, a horsepower is an understanding of what in an agricultural situation a beast of burden such as a horse can do in terms of its power output. For those of you that are familiar with the internal combustion engine for cars, usually with high-end sports cars, for example, usually the maximum power output is in the neighborhood of a thousand horsepower or a little bit more than that. So imagine, for example, a thousand of these when talking about the internal combustion engine with high-end performance sports cars. Okay? All right, that concludes our brief look at power.